Hello and welcome to the TGT Stadium. Back again with you guys for an episode of the Guna Talks Let's Talk Arsenal series uh, in which we're doing a bit of a discussion and uh, debate topic today with plenty of hard work and graphics that have gone into making this show for you. Uh, a big thing about talking about the current regime at Arsenal and kind of measuring its success is talking about the work that's been done in the transfer window to transform how Arsenal act plan and strategize their moves in the market. Very happy to be doing this show live, as always, with the help of our chat box to provide some of their own personal opinions. But how this show is going to work is I'm going to run you through how I believe that the transfer window and the work that Arsenal do within it has significantly changed over the course of the KSE era at the club, and specifically how Mikel Arteta and Edu's influence in the last few years has drastically turned things from what was a period of mediocrity, of consistent and persistent mistakes, and certainly into a side that is looking upwards rather than just trying to, you know, basically just trample along as uh, as contently as possible and not particularly making the best decisions. But thank you so much for tuning in. Please do subscribe if you haven't done so already. Uh, we're almost on our way to 40,000 subscribers. And with the new look of the channel, which I hope you're also enjoying for our Let's Talk Arsenal show, I hope that you've enjoyed what we've brought you so far in the first couple of days of the 2022-23 season. But without further ado, we kick off, uh, as always, by beginning at the beginning um, and talking about when KSE first entered the club in 2007. Now, since that time, up until December 2019, when Mikel Arteta was appointed and joined up with Edu in working on player transfers, the club has spent, according to Transfer Marked, £764.99 million pounds on players. So all those years of saying, why don't we spend any money? You know, between uh, over 12 years, Arsenal have spent uh, over three quarters of a billion pounds on players. Now, we're going to look at how that has transformed over the course of those years. And what we're going to do is looking at specifically kind of the hits and the misses of those transfers over that period, starting with the players from 07, 08. You now can play along, of course. And if you're watching on playback, you might want to leave your comments. Now, the way in which I've looked at these players is I've tried to be as blunt and as harsh as possible in some cases i had to go to twitter at times to help uh to get some help in regards to some polls for some players as well granite xhaka uh featured in particular and we'll get on it to him a little bit later but if we go through of course what we've already got with these players uh, and specifically we start with the summer of 2007 2008 uh eduardo lucas fabianski bakary sanya and lasana diara uh, of those four, uh, only Bakary Sanya I would describe personally as a hit. Now, Eduardo's miss is certainly not down to his ability, but on the unfortunate, horrific injury that he suffered. But Fabianski, despite winning an FA Cup and being in that, these signings, unfortunately, never progressed Arsenal in the position that they signed. And that's one of the big measures, I think, of whether or not we should discuss a signing as a success uh, in the context of when they arrived. Looking then forwards, 2008-2009, Arshavin Ramsey, Samir Nasri, and Mikel Silvestre. Uh, yes, so we're going this far back in the world of Arsenal transfers. And of those, Aaron Ramsey and Samir Nasri certainly, I feel, could be described as hits, uh, despite the fact that, of course, Nasri did end up moving on to Manchester City. Uh, it was a successful signing for Arsenal. It just, unfortunately, we couldn't convince him that Arsenal was the right place to remain, probably despite our hatred of the player. Can we really blame him moving off to a side like Manchester City, who had ambitions of winning much bigger things, of which he ended up doing, of course. And Aaron Ramsey, as we know, was a very successful player for Arsenal and probably one of the closest things to a modern legend at the club that we can have. Massively instrumental in winning Arsenal, those FA Cups, and uh, it shouldn't be understated how important they were. 2009-2010, a disappointing window. Uh, and of course, these are taken into account both summer and January transfer windows for these seasons of 09-10. So Sol Campbell and Thomas Vermaelen were brought in and neither, uh, I don't think, we could put down as successes. Uh, moving forward to the 2010-2011 season, uh, we have Wellington Silva, uh, Sebastian Squalacci, Maran Shamak and Lauren Koscielny. And only Lauren Koscielny, I think, can be considered a hit at the club, was a mainstay and eventual captain. Didn't leave in the best circumstances, but was, of course, a mainstay and considered one of the better centre-backs during uh, his time at the club, not just at Arsenal, but across the Premier League as well. 
in 2011-2012, Arsenal brought in a hell of a lot of players. Joel Campbell, uh, Carl Jenkinson, Per Mertesacker, Alex Oxlade chamberlain Mikel Arteta, Andre Santos, Thierry Henry, of course, joined in January, Javinho, Park Chu Young and Yossi Ben Ayun. A hell of a lot of players arrived at the club. Uh, and of all of those, only for me, Per Mertesacker, Mikel Arteta and Thierry Henry's short loan spell could be described as successes. Matazaka and Arteta formed uh, a consistent pairing, of course, went on both to become club captains at the team. Are now, of course, huge parts of the side, even in 2022. The others of those that you might think is a bit harsh, perhaps Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain, but for me, despite the fact that we sold him for big money, I don't think ever progressed the position that he joined in. We never were sure whether he would have a future at central midfield or right wing and eventually moved on for a big fee. But I wouldn't necessarily describe him as a hit or a success story at Arsenal other than what we made for him. Now, in 2012-2013, Arsenal had one of their better transfer windows. Uh, Olivier Giroud, Podolski, Santi Cazorla and Nacho Monreal arrived, of course, in the following January. Uh, And of those, only Podolski I would describe as a miss. Giroud scored over 100 goals for Arsenal. Nacho Monreal became one of the most consistent left-backs that we've had during the modern era. And Santi Cazorla, for me, is my favourite player whilst Arsenal have been at the Emirates. Uh, And for me, certainly as a club legend uh, of, of, of... not even just the modern era, just in general, genuinely love what Santi Cazorla brought to the team. So a better uh, work in the market, not particularly the frequency of signings, but the success of those signings. 2013-14, Meza Ozil, of course, arrived alongside uh, Emiliano Viviano. Uh, Yaya Sonogo was brought in, as well as Matthew Flamini. Uh, and in January, the infamous signing of Kim Kallstrom arrived at the club. Uh, of those, I feel that Meza Ozil, despite, of course, how his time at Arsenal ended, still should be rightly described as a hit. His records for assists are unmatched at Arsenal uh, and, of course, helped Arsenal to end their trophy drought in his first season winning the FA Cup and went on to win more FA Cups, I believe, than any other Arsenal player. So, describe, despite what we may think of Ozil and the, uh, the kind of split there is between fans on him I think he should fairly go down as a hit whereas the others didn't progress the positions that they came in I'm not actually looking at the chat box whilst I'm doing this because I'm on the presentation slide so I'm intrigued to look back I think over these uh, and to what you guys think on on, on these as well uh, going forward then to the 2014-15 season again fairly uh, a lot of players were brought in uh, Gabriel Paulista, Matteo Debushi, Danny Welbeck, David Ospina, Alexis Sanchez, Callum Chambers and Christian Bielik uh, were brought in during that season. And of those, I think that fairly only Alexis Sanchez can be described as a hit. Those that think that this is harsh on Callum Chambers, fair enough. I just don't think that Callum Chambers ever really did succeed at Arsenal and never managed to nail down that starting spot. Of course, that horrific injury he suffered definitely affected that. And despite Danny Welbeck scoring a famous goal against Manchester United in the FA Cup quarterfinal, for me, He doesn't go down uh, as a successful signing for the club. Didn't progress that role at all. Now, I think this might be one of the more controversial ones. Uh, Mohamed Elneny and Petr Cech arrived in what was a horrible season for transfers. Petr Cech was the only summer arrival with Elneny coming in the following January. I've put Elneny down as a miss personally, and that may seem harsh for a fair few people. But if I'm honest and being very honest about that, I don't think Elneny progressed Arsenal's midfield. He came in as a very cheap signing and has has done well as a utility player. But if I'm talking about successes at Arsenal, I'm not necessarily sure I can put Elneny down as that. He's recovered his career at Arsenal after that loan spell at Besiktas. And I'm very grateful to have him as a utility player in the team. But I wouldn't necessarily describe him as what I want to be a hit at Arsenal. Moving to 2016-17, a very, very intriguing summer. Granit Xhaka, Lucas Perez, Takuma Asano, remember him? Uh, Skodra Mustafi, uh, and lastly, Rob Holding arrived. Of those, I think that, and this is going to be controversial with Granit Xhaka, I had to go to Twitter because I was really torn on this. And I put a poll up in which 60, more than 60% of you voted Granit Xhaka to be a hit. I know that for a lot of people, perhaps his earlier years at Arsenal were misses. During Arteta's tenure, I think he's certainly been a lot, lot better and his best years have certainly been at the club there. Rob Holding, contextually, I think we can describe as a hit. Two massive performances in two FA Cup finals from him helped Arsenal to those trophies too. Uh, and for the contextual amount of money that we brought him, I think ultimately is, he's done he's done reasonably well and could be described as a hit. Um, Granite Xhaka, 
We'll always divide opinion, and I'm not expecting everyone to agree on that point either. But if anything, it's going to go further to further the point that we're going to talk about towards the end of this. Um, moving then forwards to the 2017-18, uh, Alexandra Lacazette, Saya Kalasinac, and uh, Konstantinos Mavropanos came in the summer with Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang and Henrik Mkhitaryan brought in in January to help replace the void left by Alexis Sanchez. Of these, uh, I think that Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang can only be described as a hit, whereas Lacazette, Kalasinac, Mkhitaryan and Mavropanos, the latter is unfortunate because I think there was potential for him at Arsenal, but considering who we have now at centre-back, probably wasn't ever going to succeed in the end. Aubameyang being the only hit and being a crucial striker for Arsenal, but Lacazette, I don't think, progressed Arsenal from Olivier Giroud. If we were going to spend £45 million on a striker, you'd hope that they would bring more than what the striker was there before him. In fact, I think that Giroud provided more to Arsenal during his career at the club than Lacazette was able to. Uh, moving then forwards to the 2018-19 season, uh, and this is of course the final summer uh, that we have before Mikel Arteta gets involved. Edu is now here, but of course this is pre-both of them working together. Lucas Torreira, Bernd Leno, Matteo Genduzzi, Socrates, Denis Suarez infamously in January, but before that, Stefan Lichsteiner, who was, I believe, the first signing under Unai Emery that was made. All of them. I think, have to go down as misses uh, at the club as well. So that is the overall look of what uh, we can see. Uh, and of course, uh, we move to 2019, tw uh, 2019, which is, of course, when Arteta came in. But the summer still was done under the tenure of Unai Emery. Uh, we brought in Danny Ceballos on loan, David Luiz, Nicolas Pepe, Kieran Tierney, Gabriel Martinelli and William Saliba, uh, of course. And all of those, I think, um, will split things. And I put down Tierney and Martinelli as hits. I've put Saliba as a hit. I think that we can pretty much glean from his time at the moment that this is going to be a fantastic addition to the Arsenal squad, but it's still a little bit unknown. David Luiz, I think a lot of people would say for the money we paid was probably more of a success than a failure, but I, I struggle to put him amongst the hits because he didn't necessarily progress the centre-back position for us. Did a good job and contextually with the amount of money we paid for him, sure, but I don't think we can say that he progressed the centre-back position. Nicolas Pepe, I certainly don't think with the money that we paid for him can be seen as a success. And despite me liking a lot of what Danny Ceballos potentially could have brought, I don't think that loan deal again progressed the central midfield area as much as I would have liked. Um, now, moving forwards, this is the overall look for those times under KSE. Uh, Mikel Arteta then came in in December of 2019, and the work that he and Edu has done has seen Arsenal spend 352.32 million uh, since, uh, or going up to the date that we have today, on the 2nd of August 2022, with 235.26 million uh, being spent prior to this specific transfer window, which we're, of course, going to look at. And in the winter of 2020, we brought in Pablo Marie and Cedric. I wouldn't put those two down as hits at the club, but to be honest, you know, Cedric, a decent backup, but not a hit. Pablo Marie is already going to be on his way out this summer. Moving though to the 2020 uh, season, Thomas Partey, uh, Willian, Alex Runison, and Gabriel joined in the summer with Martin Odegaard and Matt Ryan coming in in January. Thomas Partey, Gabriel, and Odegaard, I think we can all agree, uh, or at least I hope we can all agree, uh, have been hits at this point. But Willian, uh, a infamously expensive wage mistake. And Alex Runison, uh, unfortunately, was quite poor. So much so that we had to bring in another goalkeeper in January and Matt Ryan, who only played a couple of games. Uh, you may say that's harsh to put him down as a miss, but I don't think we can necessarily say that he was signed by the club and we wasn't convinced to make that deal permanent. And going into the 2021-22 season, Ben White, Tommy Asu, Ramsdale, Nuno Tavaj and Lokonga. It's tricky, this one, of course, because they've only been here a season. Um, but based upon what we've seen so far, I think Tavares goes down as the only miss because he's gone on loan. We didn't feel he was good enough to stay for another season. Uh, the other four I would put down so far as hits. The most controversial amongst those, besides perhaps Ben White for a few people, is Lukonga, um, because we've not seen enough of him and most of us feel he's not ready. But I think there is real potential in this guy for me to succeed at the club in the future in a variety of midfield roles. And that brings us all the way forward to this summer in 2022, where Gabriel Jesus, Alexander Zinchenko, uh, Matt Turner, Fabio Vieira, Marquinhos, and of course, Austin Trusty, who has gone on loan to Birmingham and had a potentially a really, really solid debut from what I'm told. 
and of course anyone else who may come in between now and the end of the window. We can't put them down as hits or misses, but I'm very hopeful that especially the likes of Jesus, Vieira, Zinchenko are going to be big hits. Who knows what will happen with Turner, Marquinhos and Trusty. I think that is, is yet to be seen, but I couldn't put them down on either side. So what does this all mean in regards to how we've worked this out? Well, from my point of view, and of course this is opinionated, this is all on what I feel has happened and it will differ from person and fan to fan. Uh, during the time of uh, Kroenke's tenure with Unai Emery and Arsene Wenger making transfer decisions, or of course Unai Emery to a lesser extent with Raul Sanyehi, so Mislint out of course in there as well. For me, we spent £490.32 million on players that were misses, that didn't push the needle, that didn't improve the team necessarily contextually to put us back where we needed to be. Of that, that means that 35.9% of the signings that we made financially were a success, whereas 28.1% of the overall total of players that we brought in were hits. That is quite staggeringly low when you compare it, especially to the short space of time that we've had during Mikel Arteta. Um, only 16.2 million of the money that we spent before this summer window for me have been misses, uh, which of course equates to 93% around that figure of the money we've spent so far, I think has been spent well by Mikel Arteta and Edu, meaning that 58.3% of the players that have been brought in over that period, I believe, also have been successes. And I would expect that percentage to rise if we were to redo this next summer. Uh, we don't know what other signings are going to be made, but I'm very, very happy with the business that we've done. I'm very, very happy with the players we've brought in. And I would hope that they would lean towards the successful side of our margins when we come back to this next summer um i'm interested to know what you guys think about this as well so we're going to take some uh take some comments from you guys i'm assuming some of you have thought i've been either too harsh or too lenient that's the way that it goes it's all opinions at the end of the day um, but i am intrigued as to what you think uh regarding this uh, lee says uh all the mislin tat transfers have now gone you know Mikel arteta as well and they do have work to move on not only all of arsene wenger's signings nearly bar granite Xhaka, rob holding and i'm struggling to think of any more mohammed el nini at this point um kieran tierney william saliba gabriel martinelli brought in under unai emery and his tenure at the club you know they're still here uh, but it's yeah we have moved on a lot a lot of players at the club. Um, and I think that the players that we are bringing in now are with the design to move Arsenal back. I think so much of the signings that we made under Arsene Wenger uh, towards that period after 2007 were just not good enough and just did not move Arsenal forwards or to where we wanted them to go. But you can see the design behind the transfers that we're doing currently. You can see the process. You can I hate that word, but you can see it and the strategy and whatever's behind the decision making. It's done for me really importantly. Um, the Sox guy says, I strongly disagree with nothing you've said so far. <laughs> Fantastic stuff. Uh, Wayne says, I can't ever see Giroud as a hit. So I'll never forgive him for that disaster against Monaco that knocked us out of the Champions League. Leno was very good for us. The reason why I put Leno as a miss is because we haven't kept him. You know, if he was a hit, I still think he would be here. But the ultimate end to this is that he's going for £8 million just, what, three seasons after we bought him. And for me, I, I can't see that as a success, as a signing. And so maybe that's harsh on Leno, but I just can't put it down as a success. Uh, the Real Yanis says, obvious that KSC are more serious about investing in the squad since they've taken up full ownership. Wenger had to bargain hunt. Uh, and I think this is absolutely fair uh, as a point to put forwards. The Cronkies since 2018 believe that this is where their ownership of Arsenal really began. And the, the work that we've done in the market since 2018 I still think, you know, there's a lot of question marks from the 2018 summer to the 2019 summer. But 2020 onwards, I think that we've made some really positive steps forward in the market. But we still spent poorly, you know, even when the KSE took over fully in 2018, that summer of 2018 and 2019, I don't look at as particularly successful summer windows. 2020 onwards, I think we've seen a lot more positivity to the money that has been invested in the team. Uh, Russ says, what was your thoughts on Mislintat? To be honest, I do think the criticism of Mislintat, considering his players have all been moved on now, 
is a little harsh because Mizan Tat, as we know, is an excellent purveyor of uh, talent. And I think that what he's doing at Stuttgart is has been very good. You know, I think he's brought in some really quality talent to that team. At Arsenal, he was never able to really put his stamp on the club. You know, Raul Sanyehi came in and took that head of football role and ran with it as a, a bit of a dictatorship. So Mizan Tat wanted to take the head of recruitment position at the club but that was never going to be possible while Raul Sanyehi was here and he therefore moved on. Of course, Raul followed him out the door fairly soon after and Edu has come in, I think, and done a good job with Mikel Arteta. But yeah, I think criticism of Sven, Sven is, is probably a little harsh because he never was able to put his stamp on the club and Raul Sanyehi's influence was much, much greater during that tenure at the club. Uh, Harry says, I agree that Mikel Arteta and Edu have been good with transfers, but where they've really failed is on contracts. Aubameyang, Runners and Willian... Still back them both and think they've learned. Uh, bring on Palace. Harry, I think you raised some excellent points. And I think that one of the key things that I didn't talk about during the presentation was that those people in particular, Arteta and Edu, have learned from some early errors in judgment. I think the Runison, the Willian situations, the Marie, the Cedrics, I think they're learning from them. And that's why a lot of the misses that we talked about during their tenure happened right at the start, either in that January that we signed Marie and Cedric or in the summer of 2020 when we signed the likes of Willian and Runison. We're learning from those errors where I feel over such a long period of time from 2007 all the way up to 2019, we just kept making mistake upon mistake upon mistake upon mistake. And yes, whilst I think that Yanis raised the point earlier on with the super chat a second ago about how Arsene Wenger had to work and bargain hunt, I still think that the way in which we moved in the market wasn't particularly smart. You know, we still invested money in players that I think we could have signed better. We could have scouted better. Arsene Wenger's kind of gems that he found during the years of great success at the club kind of lost his way a little bit. We put a lot of emphasis on stat DNA and, and that investment into that company. And whilst Arsenal still certainly use more stats nowadays, you can tell that the modern look that we have with the current setup that we are using means that we can find some better bargains than maybe we did before. Who knows? We might see Nuno Tavares and Samuel Conga turn into quite the interesting players. Uh, you know, of course, Gabriel Martinelli was brought in later on, not by Edu and Arteta, but certainly by uh, the regime that just was there before and well after Arsene Wenger had left. So I think that we're going to see some, hopefully, some big successes from those types of players in the future under this current regime as well. Um, Dom says, who are your biggest hits and misses from the pre-Arteta era? That's a really good question. Uh, let's bring up the the pre-Arteta era screen again with all of our uh, hits and misses from that period. Uh, it takes a little while to load because there's just so, <laughs> there's so many of them. Uh, let's bring that back up on the screen again. Oh, I can feel how hot my laptop is because it's not dealing well with this. So during uh, all of that, this is, of course, the last point before we move on to the Arteta era. The big, big, the biggest success for me has to be, it's close between Santi Cazorla and Alexis Sanchez. I think those two are the key ones for me as the biggest successes of the pre-Edu Arteta era. And you move into the misses, the biggest miss, you know, Nicolas Pepe is our record signing, £72 million. I think he has to be up there uh, as one of the biggest misses at the club. Uh, Alexandre Lacazette is another potential huge miss uh, as well. Uh, but looking through else, we didn't spend big. Granite Xhaka, uh, of course, is one of the hits we talk about as a divisive figure. But we have to say that Squadron Mustafi at £34 million. Pounds. It has to be one of the biggest misses, uh, one of the worst mistakes we made in the market. I think Petr Cech goes down there as well because he was the only player brought in. That's not necessarily down to him, but that summer of 2016, my goodness, how we messed up that. I, I really could have pushed for a potential title challenge because Leicester won the league that year and Arsenal, of course, finished second. What could have happened if we'd have really invested rather heavily during that period? It's very, very difficult to know now. But I think that was a real missed opportunity in 2016 and uh, as well. Dan says, Tom, I strongly disagree on your Lacazette opinion. Dan, I'd love to know why. I, I can't see how Lacazette is a success. I can't see how you can spend £45 million on a player that doesn't give you more than what Olivier Giroud ever did. I just can't see that as a successful signing. You know, Arsenal could have gone out and brought a player in for the same amount of money who could have taken us much further in that number nine role. I mean, the fact that we signed a Bamiang just six months later kind of tells you the problem um, with the Lacazette signing and that just after six months, we felt that we had to go for a player that could play at striker and dismantled or dislodged Lacazette from that striker position significantly just after six months. That, I think, is the biggest indication of Lacazette not being a successful signing 
at the club. Uh, King says, we spend more money on a centre forward that was worse than we had is a big, big miss. Uh, talking about Lacazette there. Uh, Gary says, I think our negotiation power will increase now the players we are signing are a far better quality. I feel the cancelling of contracts will hopefully be a thing of the past. Absolutely. And I think that that is obviously something that's levelled at Edu as a big failure is the fact that we've had to cancel contracts and rip up deals. But I think the honest truth is that they've had but have been burdened with so many poor signings of the latter stages of the Wenger and Emery era that Edu's had to move some of them on. Yes, we've renewed some of those deals. You think about David Luiz, you think about uh, Abamyang in particular, Meza Ozil, but that, to be fair, that wasn't us. That wasn't the current regime that renewed that. That was Arsene Wenger. But we've had to cancel those contracts because of poor decisions made towards the end of the previous regime. And I'm hoping that now we've signed some really decent players. I think, you know, Nuno Tavares, had he gone this summer on a permanent deal, I think we would have easily doubled our money that we invested in him. I think Lukonga is already worth more than what we paid for him when we signed him. I think that Ben White, and you look at the £50 million figure, that's one of the few what I would describe as investments that the club has made. And what I mean by that is that I don't think he was worth £50 million when we signed him. I think he was probably his market value for me. I would have been happier playing something like 35 ish to 35 to 40 50 million was more than what i thought he was worth and he's what i would describe as an investment that will one day become a player that will show that it was worth paying the 50 million to get him whereas if you look at someone like martin Erdegaard, you look at someone like tommy asu these are players that are already making good on that investment and arguably if they were to go in the window they would be sold for more than what we bought them for which is important and so if we move forward to edu selling in one, two, three years' time, I think you'll see us selling players for a lot better and a lot more than what we brought them in for. Um, let's go to uh, Jason. It says, given how we've cancelled contracts and been a lot sterner over outgoings, could you see other clubs maybe doing similar uh, with problem players they want to get rid of? Are we going to inspire other clubs to invest and cancel contracts? I don't know. I can't really speak for other clubs too intently as much as I can Arsenal. But I think that we've done what we unfortunately needed to do based upon the mistakes that we have. Um, let's uh, let's scroll up a bit because I feel like I missed some questions probably whilst we were doing it. Did I miss any super chats or anything as well? Uh, it's always worth me checking because I know I look at the screen when I'm not doing it. Uh, we had one from, uh, let's go to a question. I actually, want, I'm really curious to see what you guys were saying actually before I, uh, whilst I looked away. Uh, I'd say Leno was a hit, says Ronnie. Uh, again, I think I've explained why uh, I don't think he's a success. I think because the fact he's he's left, you know, if he was a success, I think we would have kept him. Obviously, I think that the way in which we want to play, for me, just didn't fall in line with what Leno was. Um, but that's fine if you disagree on that. I think he was because I don't. If he was a hit, I think he'd still be here. Um, but unfortunately, that's just the way that it is. Uh, let's go to scrolling towards <laughs> King says, if Dan is brave enough, we can do a stream. It would be fun. I would love to see Dan jump on a stream and try and justify Alexandra Lacazette being a hit. Uh, I'd love to. I'd watch that. I would absolutely watch that. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, let's go to. Uh, oh, that's a question for Jason. Uh, Dan G says, other teams know we aren't going to use some players and they have huge wages. So we have no leverage at all. So I don't blame Edu and Arteta for all of the cheap exits. Uh, Frantishek says, Tom, the disrespect for one of the only Lord Mustafi is unreal. He gave us so many memories that we will never forget. Yeah, but not for the right reasons, mate. <laughs> not for the right reasons at all. Uh, same says uh, Tomas Vermullen was a hit. I don't think he was. His injuries were legendary. Uh, and just for me, never ever progressed the centre back position. Was replaced by a pair of Zaka rightly. No, not a hit for me. Um, I said holding was a hit, Yanis. Uh, for the 2.7 million that we brought him in for, I think that contextually, what he's done, what he did in two FA Cup finals, I would put him down as a hit for me personally. Uh, Billy Boy says, Tom, do you think the delay in the final one or two signs of this window is because we are confident we can get maximum points in our first five games? I have talked about that at length. I think the reason why Arsenal are willing to go into the Premier League season with the window still open is because they are confident about the club that they have, the, the squad that they have and what they're able to do with the players going forwards. Uh, anyway, we're going to round things off there. Do let me know in the chat box, in the comment section below after the show is finished, what you think about this video, how you see Arsenal's success. You may have disagreed with some of the overall points about hits and misses, but what I care about most is whether or not you agree on the point that things are definitely improving with how Arsenal are recruiting. 
I think if you look at the success rate of the money that we've spent, I think if you look at the success and the number of players that we've bought in compared to that period before Arteta and Edu, the, the difference is, is clear and obvious in progressing us forwards. Thank you for tuning in. Do drop a like on the video. It does take quite a lot of effort putting some of these presentations together and it really does help show the support to the channel and, of course, spread the word as YouTube algorithms do spread the word greater if you help by dropping a like on the video. Thank you for tuning in. I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, of course, at 8am. Thank you for listening and, as always, up the Arsenal. <laughs>